So hopefully that some of the stuff I'm going to talk to you about will be repetitive in terms of what you've heard and understand around the intersection between health, poverty, um, and life expectancy. And I'm going to do something that um, a speaker taught me a long time ago, which is tell everyone the conclusion right at the beginning. So in case they fall asleep or start to nod off or start to text, you always remember um, um, what the key points were. <clears throat> and one of the key points I'm going to make today is just this concept of um, where where you live defines how long you live. And it's an important, interesting um, dynamic in the United States. <clears throat> and it's very much um, an epiphenomenon that has been evolving for a number of time, of number of years. Um, and, and now it's kind of a, an interesting point in terms of, of where we understand some more of that data. I'm going to also talk to you a little bit about um, the federal and the non-federal efforts to deal with these challenges and issues around health reform and health disparities and then segue a little bit into what I think are some of the opportunities um, and, uh, um, that I think that we can be thinking about as healthcare and health policy goes through this um, other time of transition. So starting off with some of the kind of basics. So differences in life expectancy across the United States. This is some of the um, Robert Wood Johnson data that many of you are very familiar with, looking at the fact that um, where people live, as I said before, really dictates um, how long you live across different parts um, in the um, in the country. Whenever I speak and talk about this topic, I always try to um, pick, a, pick um, data that is not about where I'm giving the talk because people sometimes get offended. So this is some interesting data um, from Boston that just kind of illustrates um, how impactful um, this concept is. And um, I actually uh, spent some time at Massachusetts General Hospital. <clears throat> and uh, Massachusetts General Hospital is located near the Back Bay area. And the difference in going on the red line, um, going from Back Bay down to Dorchester in terms of life expectancy is going from around 91 years to about 58 um, uh, years in terms of life expectancy. So what does that mean? Well, I'll give you three kind of interesting statistics. So one, um, that's about going from the life expectancy um, in terms of 58.9 years uh, back into 1915. That's how long Americans used to live back in about 1910, 1915. So I like to say that it's about going 100 years back in time um, in terms of the impact in terms of health outcomes. Um, <clears throat> another kind of interesting um, um, conceptual understanding of this is that's about um, um, less than a life expectancy in Haiti that's left in a life expectancy in Rwanda um, and many other areas where we export um, avidly our aid efforts in terms of improving health and outcomes in those areas, when in fact, quite frankly, um, we face a lot of these similar challenges very um, locally. And so um, um, caveat here, if there's anything you forget, um, which I think you'll probably forget 98% of the stuff I'll talk about here today, it is this concept, um, I'd want you to remember this concept that the challenge we're facing in terms of poverty and health outcomes is right here. We sometimes don't, when I um, used to lecture and teach um, uh, medical students and public health students, a lot of folks would be excited to you know, get on a plane um, and then fly somewhere and then get into a little, little rickety car and then go through the woods and then go to somewhere and then to help folks. When I say, you know what, we have some really bad numbers right here if you just actually get on the train and just go about five minutes down, um, down the road from here, you will enter third world conditions. The other interesting thing, if you kind of follow the political lexicon and a lot of the dynamics in a lot of communities, is that people think that um, what's occurring in these communities in terms of health outcomes is secondary to violence and murder and all of these other kinds of things that make the headlines. What's really killing people in Baltimore and the south side of Chicago and in a lot of different areas is chronic diseases. And what's really driving these life expectancy numbers overall is heart disease, um, diabetes, hypertension, chronic kidney disease, and all these other kinds of things. And so what you see here is a de facto um, um, instance of privilege. Oh, I'm sorry. By the way, 58.9 um, years. Um, all that is about um, uh, that area and that zip code um, in Roxburgh is about 10 minutes drive from three of the world's best health care organizations. So you have Beth Israel, you have Massachusetts General Hospital, you have Brigham um, Hospital, all in about 10, 15 minutes drive. So what are we doing wrong here? Um, obviously, what, we're, what we're, we're seeing here is that um, even in very close proximity in terms of location, we're not seeing the kinds of health outcomes that we would like to see universally in a lot of these communities. And a lot of these communities that uh, people like me are from, uh, where I'm from in terms of Miami, Florida, and all those kind of interesting areas. <clears throat> and so understanding the gravity of these situations, the other kind of caveat I'll tell you is that um, 
um, um, these numbers, uh, when you look at kind of what's happening in health outcomes in urban populations and some of these urban core populations, these numbers are not, um, uh, life expectancy numbers are not on a um, steady incline. In fact, they're probably on a flat line um, if you look through where things have been going over the last couple of years. So again, what do you remember from this is that we face some real serious challenges locally. And a lot of these challenges that we face um, are impacting just how long uh, people live and the world that they live in. And so I say that you can go 100 years back in time um, just by getting um, um, driving about uh, 10 or 15 minutes in some of these local communities. All right, I wouldn't be fair if I didn't throw some researchy um, numbers at you. And this is, um, um, so I'm a cardiologist by training, and this is um, some of the um, um, data that we've been um, pr talking about in terms of what makes up and define some of these communities. <clears throat> we think about the phenotypical dynamics. So we go, well, you know, we know that um, uh, many of these communities have a high minority prevalence. So when we go into these communities, we think that is a distinguishing factor. And of course, a lot of you who know a lot about um, science and public health know that race, um, um, uh, we share about 99% of our genes in terms of similarities. Um, but, but, but understanding just how this um, uh, plays out is kind of interesting. So this is um, um, what we call a propensity analysis. Don't get lost in all of this. Just pay attention to the dot graphics. Um, um, looking at the differences in terms of one-year outcomes um, after a heart attack between black and white patients. <clears throat> and these, these, these dots that you see over here in terms of all the different dots um, are individual patients and the aggregate in terms of why, how their characteristics aggregate one versus the other. And what you need to kind of understand here is when you look at it, you see that the black patients kind of aggregate together and the white patients kind of aggregate together. And you think, well, you know, again, going back to what I said before, you know, is this kind of the phenotypic dynamics in terms of what drives these, up, these outcomes? When you look at this slide, this is um, data we did where we start to separate out what makes the difference between black and white patients. Um, and this is, again, remember, we're not talking about things like, you know, um, you know, incidence of hypertension or even some of these proxy measures. All of these things I'm talking to you about, about life expectancy. And so if I was a carpenter, maybe I'd talk about hammering more. But as a physician, as a clinician, this concept of life expectancy is the core, right? So how long are people living and what drives um, how long people can live? So this slide is looking at this issue of, um, again, one-year outcomes after having an MI, how long people live. And what you see, if you kind of follow these little boxes um, from the top down to the bottom, is that um, the difference between black and white patients in terms of age and sex, in terms of how long um, people live and how, how their ability to survive after a heart attack, it's pretty much the same between uh, black and white patients if you just use age and sex parameters. And the biggest thing that differentiates um, these patients are actually the social and environmental factors, meaning um, how <clears throat> the kinds of um, a place, really the, where they live in terms of um, a place and location, and all the kinds of things in terms of housing, transportation, and all of those proxy factors that define a social area. So going from that first set of boxes to the second is where you see the biggest um, uh, difference. And then when you go down in terms of those other boxes, they pretty much um, uh, kind of stay together a lot more closely over time. And the biggest difference you really see is these social factors. So what does it mean? It means this concept of where you live genuinely defines how long you live in such a disturbing way um, that it is, it, is, it is something that I think we have to give more thought to from a policy context. Because literally, if you have a heart attack in the United States, <coughs> Um, it doesn't matter, again, whether you're really black or white. It doesn't matter in terms of even sometimes to some degree the, the prevalence of hypertension or all the, the, these chronic diseases that you may have. When you start to look at some of these graphs, really the kind of defining factor that makes the biggest difference is whether you have the heart attack in one zip code versus another. And so when we start to think about an egalitarian society, um, we kind of get disenfranchised with this concept about just how much these factors um, are driving overall. So this makes, um, goes back to some of these um, uh, ideas that Sir Michael Marma, the guy who put out the big report on social determinants of health, made back um, a couple of years ago when the World Health Commission on Social Determinants of Health um, released a report. And he said um, this idea of why do we keep treating people for illnesses, only sending them back to the conditions that actually created and drive these illnesses in the first place. Again, <clears throat> um, in terms of looking at this as a Western phenomenon, you see similar um, 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 numbers in terms of when you look at places um, like England and other places um, in Europe as you do in the United States. But the thing that drives the most, um, uh, what I say, startling 
um, uh, characteristics of um, these numbers in the U.S. is just how close um, we are in terms of, of some of these um, uh, different locations compared one to another. I remember um, when I would, again, would kind of talk and teach my students, I would always say, um, you know, the length of time it takes you to see some of these differences is about the length of time um, in terms of even travel, is about the length of time it takes you to eat a meal. Um, so really, a lot of these things are very local, especially in places like New York City, uh, Boston, um, um, and, and other, other major areas. All right, I'm going to change gears a little bit to give you a, 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 some perspective in terms of understanding. So this concept of how we deal with disenfranchised population, again, you know, we use race as a proxy for a number of these kinds of challenges. But these, um, this issue about how we deal with um, health outcomes um, in different populations has been um, something that has been a challenge for a long time. And what I, uh, one thing I learned something from my mom is she always used to say, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. And a lot of these discussions we have now around health policy and um, even the current discussion we're having now in terms of this healthcare debate and what to do with Medicaid and understanding some of these things. We've been having these discussions for a long time. And when I say a long time, I'm not talking, a lot of people think we're talking back to the 1990s um, in terms of the prior Clinton plan. But I can show you some quotes, and we'll go into that in a second, going back to the Truman days and going back to Teddy Roosevelt and even going back to some of those earlier time periods in terms of uh, folks having a generic understanding that these differences in life expectancy and the difference in health outcomes actually define us as a country. So this is just an example of some of the more um, um, uh, recent activities um, um, that have occurred over time. And I'm going to go through this quickly um, to carry to this slide to show you one important factor. This is um, a graph done by um, a very good friend of mine who published a book about the Affordable Care Act and other things showing um, just how many bills and activities have occurred around minority health and health disparities over the past 20 years. What's really interesting about this, as we kind of enter this um, new time period around politics, is a lot of things happened in both administrations. And it's important to know that even when you look back into the 1980s, the first Secretary's Task Force on Black and Minority Health, so the first report on black and minority health and established Office of Minority Health and all of these NIH entities that give us all of these funds for all the stuff we did was actually by um, uh, Margaret Heckler, um, a Republican congresswoman from Massachusetts who became Secretary of HHS. And so a lot of the activities that actually served as a basis around federal and state efforts around minority health and health disparities actually happened um, during the Reagan era. Um, and then subsequent activities built on that, um, there was a guy by the name of Dr. Lou Sullivan was Secretary of HHS um, after that um, in the Bush time period, in the, the first um, President Bush time period, who did a lot of work in establishing um, what's occurred around um, um, health disparities at NIH and other places. And so <clears throat> why do I kind of throw this out there? It's because, again, we're going through this transition time period. It's important to understand when you look back, going back to what my mom taught me in terms of understanding what's happened in the past, it gives you a, an, an inkling in terms of understanding what can potentially happen in the future. I said to you before <clears throat> that this discussion about um, how to take care of poor populations has been going on for a long time. Um, in fact, when I, um, um, uh, some of the, the kind of um, interesting quotes is that if you look at back to what things like what Teddy Roosevelt said about taking care of poor and underserved communities, and then what Truman said, and even some of the stuff that Nixon did um, in terms of his attempts at health reform, multiple times the same conversation um, through different administrations and through different time periods. So we sometimes always think that what's happening here right now is the first time that it's happening. All of these things have happened uh, many times before. Um, and it's happened um, in different aspects and through different efforts. And what's important to kind of understand, especially as we go through again through this kind of heightened time of political transitions, um, is that because these problems are very much pervasive, um, they tend to drive a variety of different discussions. So the methodologies may change, but really tr through, through time, through both um, uh, Republican and Democratic administrations over the past um, hundred years um, have been different cycles about how to deal with some of these challenges. Um, I always throw this slide up when people talk about Medicaid, um, because a lot of folks think, you know, right now is the first time we just talked about Medicaid. Like, whatever discussion we're having now is the only time we've ever done it, and it's the first time we're doing it. So we react in a very emotional way in that context. So Medicaid, um, when it was started back in 1966, only had um, six states. 
and it took until 1982 for Medicaid to become a truly national program when Arizona signed on. So what does that mean? It means we've been talking about this stuff for a long time. And sometimes, again, going back to my mom, um, sometimes though the road is kind of um, rocky and windy, um, the fun part about life is when we get to that destination. We're still on that road. Um, and it's important not to lose perspective in terms of looking both in the rearview mirror and looking forward, um, and that these kinds of things go through all kinds of ups and downs, um, whether we talk about Medicare, Medicaid, and all of these different programs. And when you look back to when Lyndon Johnson put in, put in place Medicare and Medicaid back in 1966, and you look back at that pr press conference, and you look back at all these different things, what they were talking about then is the same things we were talking about now. It's the same things that we've been talking about for a long time, which is how do we take care of the poor and underserved populations in those places in the United States where people um, have a shorter life expectancy um, in a long time. And Lyndon Johnson um, did a lot back then in terms of Civil Rights Act and all the different things um, that occurred around the same time. But he also realized, as we should all do, that this is a long-term process. It takes more than four years. It takes more than eight years, as we are seeing right now, and sometimes can take up to 20 years for these programs to become national programs. So what I, why, why I throw this out, out um, don't get too alarmed about the discussions now in terms of how some of these policies change through administrations, because that's happened all the time, okay? Um, but the core thing is to, in terms of understanding is how does the science and the data drive a lot of these things? Um, I'm gonna skip over some of my slides because I know I have too much. Oh, let me just show you two things to talk about. All right, so I'm sorry, I'm not gonna skip over some of these slides. I will in a second, I will skip, but I just want to show you some kind of interesting things in terms of understanding even the impact of some of these efforts. So again, you remember I said to you before that a lot of these programs and policies have been designed around this idea of not how you take care of the worried well, but some of the most disenfranchised populations um, over, over time. And this is an interesting slide looking at the impact um, of, um, of the implementation of um, a Medicaid expansion in certain particular states, and to what degree does it actually um, um, uh, have, a, have a difference in terms of life expectancy. And what you see here, um, as you look kind of from the bottom to the top slide, is from those states who um, did expansion versus not, yes, there was some difference in terms of, of um, life expectancy and health outcomes, but not as dramatic as we would have expected, right? And why is that? It's because a lot of these problems, as you saw from our earlier slides, are actually very much hyper-local. And the more you can drive down activities to the local level, is more in terms of where you get um, changes. And so when we, um, when we think about health policy and health reform and the kinds of strategies, um, we sometimes get caught up in um, just the things that are in front of us now. But we should take a step back and look at the science and the impact of those things that are in front of us now. And truthfully, some of these things have had interesting health outcomes. This is another um, um, uh, 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 piece of data that was published by Ashish Jha and others looking at um, whether pay for performance, one of the kind of big things we're also using now um, when implemented, um, whether it's actually changed life expectancy. And what you see is red and blue um, um, in terms of hospitals that did pay performance versus hospitals that didn't. And without getting onto details, you see that the graphs looks exactly the same, right? So if you look at kind of those past two graphs, you see that a lot of these things that we are currently looking at in terms of solutions, though I actually think are very good solutions um, in terms of how we deal with this, um, have had mixed impact in terms of life expectancy. And again, um, life expectancy to me is always kind of the end all, be all um, uh, in general. One um, uh, uh, um, kind of bright spark in terms of looking at this and thinking this through is this is some data on pay for performance in the United States, uh, I'm sorry, in the UK. Um, and what you see from the furthest slide to my right going into the, to the slide to the left is that when they implemented um, this concept of pay performance that took into accordance um, issues like social factors and where housing and transportation were gonna drive health outcomes. If you see, um, uh, what you see on the furthest right is different quintiles, meaning going from poor to rich populations. Um, and you see some of the difference in health outcomes. So what you see, if you go all the way over to my left, is that all boats rose in terms of health outcomes when implemented with this concept of understanding a lot more about these social factors. Um, what does this mean? It means sometimes this stuff can get tough, kind of tangly, sometimes boring. Um, but, you know, really, 
we have an opportunity where we can actually improve um, uh, life expectancy and health outcomes. But a lot of it has to take into account um, particularly these concepts of where people live. All right. Uh, let me skip, skip over a couple of things here. This is um, a, um, a slide of some work that um, um, some of my colleagues did at University of Florida looking at um, Texas uh, Medicaid. And so we all think hospital readmissions, bad thing, and we're all about stopping. We need to decrease hospital readmissions. So this is an interesting study where they were looking at um, um, hospital readmissions, and they went and asked people who are in uh, the Medicaid population who are dual income, dual eligible folks, um, you know, what do you think about, you know, re hospital readmission? Do you agree that it's a bad thing? Because we're trying to stop you from being readmitted. Um, and it was some interesting um, answers in the focus groups. So they're like, wait, what? You're stopping us from being readmitted? <laughs> wait, but this is where we feel better. Um, this is where, you know, when my kid has an asthma attack, I come and where, you know, Diane meets us at the, you know, the check-in, um, and then I go back, and there's a nurse, and there's Charlie, and then Charlie helps make my baby feel better. Why are you stopping me from being readmitted? Um, please stop doing that, right? And this is an interesting understanding about, again, looking at the policies and concepts that we utilize in healthcare, and to what degree um, do people, um, um, especially folks who are trying to make a difference, um, do these um, outcomes really matter? So again, many of you have seen this slide about this concept of you know, where we target our resources. Again, what would I say is kind of the, the middle take-home point if you kind of look at all of this. The problems are challenging. The, we have been employing a number of solutions for a number of years. A lot of the stuff we're talking about, though exciting now, is not new. And so how do we start to then kind of evolve the discussion to talk about some of the things that can actually change health outcomes? And the, the one thing I will think that we have an opportunity now that we didn't have before is we have through communications mechanisms, particularly things um, like you know, mobile technology and all other kinds of things, to be able to reach people more and people to kind of change people's um, outcomes in a different way. And so I always go back to this idea of you know, what our goal should always be to make the healthier decision or the healthier option, um, um, the default option. And this has worked. And so this is an, a slide looking at um, um, uh, disparities in flu or in, in vaccination outcomes in um, looking at uh, race ethnicity between um, uh, both adults and children. And if you look over to your to my left, the first thing you'll see is 2008, 2009. And you'll see that we saw significant disparities in terms of outcomes between um, white and black, um, both adults and children. And particularly, the kids' numbers was particularly concerning. So you see 18% um, in terms of Hispanic kids, 25% um, white, and then 20% black. And those are bad numbers across the board, period. But you start to see significant health disparities. Fast forward through 2011, and actually you see um, um, when you look at both, but particularly for children, you see actually some of those disparities um, have not only been um, eliminated, but in fact have been reversed. And these efforts um, have been a lot of things that have occurred at the same, same time. One is this concept of um, the CDC vaccination programs and um, some of the activities that have gained enough momentum to make a difference. But one of the other really interesting things, and again, if you start to nod off, this is where I would try to kind of think about where, you, where we target our efforts, is that um, as more commercial um, uh, folks like Walgreens and all of these other um, kinds of entities got into the business of flu vaccination, they were like, wait, you're sending people to the public health departments? It's going to the public health department. <laughs> Why don't you start doing it in stores where people are and start to reach people where they live in a more um, dynamic way? And you've seen these very convenient ways in which kids are getting vaccinated. And this stuff has made a tremendous difference. So it means that though the problems have been old and with us um, for a long time, that we actually have the opportunity now because we have the knowledge base, the techniques, and all these different kinds of things um, to be able to do things different. And this idea of making the default the decision, the healthy decision, um, is something that actually changes lives. And when I used to um, teach, I would always say, you know, high, vast majority of people who get involved in public health, public policy, you know, you don't do it because of the money because there is no money. Um, there. Um, you do it because of this passion to make a difference. So why don't we start targeting our efforts 
um, in terms of what, all the stuff that we know um, that um, has been done and can be done, but more importantly, the passions and thoughts of, of things that people um, are doing and what we can do. Why don't we target it, not just in just random Brownian motion, but to the kinds of things that can work, that we know do work. And so this is one of those things that I use as the evidence to show um, that when you utilize not just um, technology, but this concept of reaching people where they are, that you actually do change outcomes and you do change numbers. And though we haven't reduced a lot of disparities over time, this is one of those things. And it really um, had a lot to do with um, utilizing different techniques. I'm going to now change into the last part. So the, the first part, we talked about kind of what's really driving these numbers in terms of where people live. Second part, we really just talked about um, this fact that we've been facing challenges. Uh, I'm sorry, that there is, um, we've been facing these challenges for a long time. We've tried a lot of different things. Many things haven't worked. It's not as political as you think it is, um, despite what you might see on Fox or MSNBC. Um, but you know, we've really just kind of gone through different waves of um, time periods, um, and that there is an opportunity. This next part is probably less science-based and more my opinion of what, what I think is some kind of one of the unique opportunities. So I saw an interesting um, statistic yesterday, um, and it was talking about Black Friday numbers, and that 33% of Black Friday activities occurred um, via um, uh, cell phones. Um, and the cell phone and mobile technology um, has become such a daily part of our life now. It's replaced cameras. Um, it's replaced maps. Remember, we used to break out maps when we were going places. I actually remember that. Um, and try to go down one side and one side to find a location. So it's replaced maps. It's replaced um, 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 how we communicate. Um, it's replaced um, how we interact with each other. Um, the other day when there was um, an emergency situation, one in local counties, um, you know, um, this is how people know that something's happening. So I view this kind of technology as not just, nobody uses their phone to actually talk anymore. In fact, that's but like the least um, uh, uh, thing that we use our phone for. We use it for all these other um, different kinds of things. Um, and I think that this concept of mobile technology is an example of the kinds of things that we can use to reach people. Now, what's happened right now is we've become too enamored in the concept of the technology versus the concept of people. But I do believe that these kinds of technologies can break down some of the geographic barriers and isolation um, that people in many um, urban communities uh, face. In, um, uh, soon after Katrina hit, when I was in the Commission Corps, we had gone down um, to uh, New Orleans. Um, this guy by the name of Craig Vandewagen, who was leading emergency efforts then, and we all went down. It was kind of a very moving time period for me. And um, for those of you who don't know about the Commission Corps, it's this amazing core of physicians, and not just physicians, but healthcare leaders. I call all of them leaders who really kind of take care of the community. Anyway, so I was a part of the Commission Corps, went down, and one of the most, and one of the most interesting experiences is we were talking to people who were in the Superdome. Um, and I was talking to folks, and you'd be like, well, why didn't you just leave? You know, why didn't you just get in your car? You knew this was coming. Why didn't you just get in the car and drive? Just drive. Just drive until you, know, you could find um, a safer place. And that just underscored to me the ignorance that many of us have of what's really occurring in urban communities, some of these urban core communities. A lot of the folks who would talk to in Superdome would be say, drive aware. We haven't seen, we don't know of any other place. We don't know um, um, of different worlds. What we know here is of what's occurring in the lower eighth and ninth ward. This is the only world we've seen. And so technology allows us to be able to reach people so that they can see other things and understand other things. And for those of us who don't have those challenges, we take that for granted. Okay, I got my five minute warning, so let me speed up. Uh, um, so, so this is where I view kind of the spectrum of things like technology and why this tool can help us reach underserved populations. Um, this is some of the examples of some of the kinds of things that we're using technology for. This is an um, interesting study of even how um, we're using mobile phones to replace things um, like pulmonary function tests and the fact that you can um, be in a, you know, in a in a, a very remote area and you know, um, check what your lung capacity is and that be sent back to your physician. Um, this is an example of an activity that we're doing um, with um, a group called the Camden Coalition where we're trying to have providers and clinicians um, get the um, social um, um, uh, information about particular patients at the time they see them. So understand when you see a patient you don't see your hemoglobin A1C um, or, the, or their LDL or some other clinical number that you see, what's the housing and transportation challenges that they face um, within a particular neighborhood. I'm speaking really fast, so if Jamaican accent comes out, forgive me. Uh, 
Let's realize that I only have a couple of minutes left. Um, and so where am I going with all of this? It is to say that there's tons of different kinds of tools that are technologically related that can open up um, the ability to reach people who um, might either be geographically um, in terms of being physically isolated. Remember, physically isolated doesn't mean that they live in Montana um, or somewhere else. They could be physically isolated looking right over there, but having never left um, you know, a certain um, a radius in terms of um, the blocks that they have been introduced to and that their grandparents have lived at and all these kinds of things. And I do think that when you open up um, the, the concept that people see other worlds, um, it's particularly important. So. Um, again, this is kind of just a snapshot of where I think technology um, can be utilized. And so I bring this up to say that a couple of things. I think that, like I said before, we have significant challenges that are very much real. Um, and they are so real that they define just how long uh, people live. We've been dealing with these challenges for a long time. There are some cues and clues to um, the kinds of efforts that can be successful. And I would say that the cues and clues um, are to make um, um, uh, public health um, and the, the, the kind of health care, the default um, um, decision, and having folks understand some of that. And what we have now that we didn't have you know, 15 years ago or 20 years ago, or even you know, 50 years ago and those kinds of things, is we have um, the kinds of technology that have people be more connected, and we have to think through how do we utilize that um, appropriately. Other than the tech, it's not even the technology, it's about how we kind of use these things. So I think that is um, um, the... Um, the biggest opportunity um, that we have now. If I was a young person kind of getting into this work and, you know, a younger person, uh, I'm kind of getting into this work and kind of um, thinking about this, I would want to direct all my passions um, to knowing that I could change the world. And we have the opportunity now that we can change the world. There are some things that are not captured again on television all the time. There are some world-changing things happening right now. And a lot of that has to do with the fast pace in which information is being exchanged, information is empowering people, um, and people are starting to do things in a very different way. I mean, look at what happened in the Middle East um, in terms of the Arab Spring, um, totally driven by connectivity. Um, so connectivity can not only change um, you know, just kind of you know, uh, how people um, interact with each other, it can literally change political infrastructure and change the dynamics of a country. And I think that we can use some of those concepts and ideas in healthcare um, to help transform where we are now. Uh, okay, good, sorry. On time-ish, so it's kind of sorted. Okay, um, so almost on time. Um, the bottom line is um, every th the three points, again, if you kind of nodded off, and I kind of nodded off too while I was giving this talk. Um, three points is the challenges and the numbers in terms of these health disparities numbers are deeply disturbing. Um, we have people living in third world conditions um, in the Bronx. We have third people living in third world conditions in Manhattan. We have people living in third world conditions um, in Boston, in Miami, um, in Orlando, in all these different areas, 15, 20 minutes away from some of the best uh, medical centers in the world, um, Baltimore, um, and all these different things. So we have real, real deep um, challenges right now as a country. Second issue, if you forget, if, again, if I remember, if I kind of hit this over, hit you with this too many times, especially now because everybody's all nervous, is that these things are not new. Um, don't be nervous. Don't freak out. Um, a lot of this stuff is not new. Um, the politics might be new, but a lot of the challenges and even the strategies um, have, uh, that people have been talking around have been going on for a long time. Um, and so um, you know, a lot of the stuff is in new. The one thing is new is that we do have some new tools now that we didn't have before that we should think about using, and I think that is the best opportunity that we have. Thank you.